briefing, briefing yeah. members to yeah. study. Sorry, do you know Allie Bone? Yeah. So Allie I know Bone, the name. Yeah, so she had a very similar experience. She got a job at the ACLU right out of college. Working, she's like working with all the affiliates. She's like drafting the legislation. Um, but she kind of realized that like she had a lottery, right? If she wanted, and so she, then she went to Georgetown. And it was like, you know, um, it was just like it was just a funny experience. It's, 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 it's doing things in reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so far, it's been pretty good. It's a lot of scheduling. At least the one every year. Are you living in this area, or? I'm still in my apartment that I was in for the yeah, event. Yeah. I'm just still in the city, like commuting. I've been looking at. I've been for the entire year. I've been looking for different places, but I've never really seen them. Okay. Well. Yeah. Also, like living in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Would you mind uh, writing your name and email for us? All right, just in case folks have questions. And uh, we'll get started in a couple of months. Maybe the green zone is working. Technical. Okay. All right. Um, I should make sure I remember my marching orders. And then you're talking about I, I can look I can talk about legal issues, right? And you're going to talk about, talk about the policies. Policies. Yeah. Okay. The okay. reform side. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Sounds good. So I think it's time to like five minutes. goes all of the work. Also, how do you even have a day job? I'm dying right now. It's starting to feel like spring 2014, mm -hmm. where just the media crush and the lobbying crush is just it's out of control. Like, everything I'm working on is coming up for a vote. And we just, um, my sponsor to the commission, uh, Council Member McElhaney, is on fire and basically just letting me feed her ordinances right now. So I'm bringing more work to the uh, commission. Um, tomorrow we're doing a, a JTTF mm. MOU, not quite as strong as San Francisco, but okay. um, it will have a decent legal impact. Um, and then, and then um, uh, she just told me last night she's willing to do the, the anti-Muslim registry ordinance that San Francisco just adopted. Okay. So now I'm going to bring that back. And that might be a special meeting because we've got all these other things going on. Just discovered an ICE 2017 MOU that no one in Oakland knew about. I'm like, why are we in this? So okay. now i got to ask a bunch of questions about that. And it's just the BART board will be voting next month. Berkeley is turning into a headache um, dealing with citizen commissions. So that's a lot of meetings. And I mean, in San Francisco, we've got a working group going, so. Oh, thank you. It's great success, but just, no, it's been I don't. But you're, I'm, I'm, yeah. And what is your day job? Um, I'm at an admin law firm just down uh, on the Oakland-Berkeley border. So a lot of licensing defense type of stuff. This is an amazing tour. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, stingrays are, uh, stingrays are more popular than I thought. Yeah, yeah, right yeah off, well. Right. Yeah. Um, you, it's right? a good name. Yeah, so, whoever named it is a favor, like carnivore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, so since we're both standing here, do you want to um, just take a minute? Do you guys know each other? I'm sorry. Um, 
Brian Hilton. Hey, Brian. How's it going? Steve Trish. Hey. I guess you're going to be starting. Yeah, we're starting now. Yeah, we have a couple minutes. Okay. Which ones? They were from they were from Florida. Um, so there's two dumps, and it looks like they both came from a Florida police department, a Florida intelligence agency. Um, was it the Guardian or the Intercept? That, uh, and it was right before my last meeting, so it's probably like in August. Yeah. The Intercept. Mm -hmm. They had um, a few of them. Yeah. Yeah, that was very helpful. Um, you know that a lot of what I've been speculating on is true. <laughs> that's like, yeah, I think this is kind of what happened. Yeah, that's, that's actually what, what I was think. the most helpful? Um, I think the registration mode yeah. instructions that really did show me what the dragnet was, and then also sort of like the temporary MC, whatever that's called. Timsy. Timsy, yeah. So, you know, kind of figuring that part out. Um, uh, you know, also just sort of alarming and not seeing any mention of content or reception, meaning like no express prohibition, like, hey guys, you know, don't pair this with certain software. Yeah. Um, and, and seeing the possibility of saving MC codes because it showed you, I don't, and, and, and they had the link to the little video as well, so you could watch them install it, and you could see how you could easily, you know, go to some one a protected event, you know, collect all the MC codes and then just save it in a database for later cross reference. Yeah. Uh, so that that was like the biggest I think eye opener. For me. Uh, just you know, confirming everybody says, oh yeah, it's operating in a dragnet. How do you know? It's, it's never actually been demoed for you. Um, kind of nice to get confirmation. And specifically, like, even when it's in, like, touch and release mode, it's still, still interrogating with everyone's phone. It's yeah. just not supposedly to be stolen it. Right. Um, yeah. Automatically discarding, <laughs> as they say. Which is kind of where I think we're going to get with, like, Oakland's NPR policy. It's like, all right. You're out there scanning. Yeah. It's not on a hit list. I don't want you to retain it. I think that might be a compromise well. I can actually get you out of that. Um, yeah, no. Okay. Let's see. Are we ready? Yeah, let's go. The Center for Law and Technology. He was on the privacy test, test. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, so we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, thanks, all of you, for coming. Uh, my name is Mukund. I'm a 1L here at Berkeley Law, and I'm a member of the Berkeley Information Privacy Law Association. Can you all, uh, is this too loud? Too quiet? That's good? Okay, cool. Uh, so this is a panel on stingrays and police surveillance. Uh, just by a show of hands, before uh, knowing about this event, who had heard of stingrays? Okay, so that's actually a decent amount. Uh, stingrays are military-grade surveillance equipment used in secret by local law enforcement to track your cell phone without legislative approval or judicial oversight. When paired with certain software, a stingray can intercept your calls, text messages, phone logs, and pictures. Uh, stingrays have become an issue in cities across the country. Uh, in Chicago, a lawsuit was recently filed by a member of the National Lawyers Guild for the police uh, there using stingrays during a Black Lives Matter protest. In Oakland, uh, they've become a major regulatory issue. And these are all issues that we'll get into uh, during the panel. Uh, we have three great panelists who have agreed to dedicate some time to talking to us today about stingrays. Um, first up will be Steve Trush, who's a master's candidate at the UC Berkeley School of Information. He specializes in information policy and international development. His current work explores the broad impact of technologies on the tensions between national security and human rights or civil liberties, including studying police-citizen interactions. After that, we'll have Professor Catherine Crump, who is an assistant clinical professor of law and acting director of the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic. 
She's an experienced litigator who specializes in constitutional matters. Uh, she's represented a broad range of clients seeking to vindicate their First and Fourth Amendment rights. She also has extensive experience litig litigating to compel the disclosure of government records under the Freedom of Information Act. Her primary interest is the impact of new technologies on civil liberties. And last, we'll have uh, Brian Hofer, who is the chair of the Oakland Privacy Commission, uh, which is currently um, overseeing regulation of uh, the uh, procurement of stingrays in Oakland. In an interview with the East Bay Express, uh, Brian Hofer describes himself as a normal guy, an unaffiliated private citizen, uh, when he learned two years ago about a plan to assemble a massive citywide surveillance system in Oakland, which was called the Domain Awareness Center. He started attending meetings of the newly formed Oakland Privacy Working Group. He says, we weren't the ACLU, we were just a ragtag bunch that showed up to change our government. And he is now definitely in a position to do that, again, as the chair of the Oakland Privacy Commission. So let's get started, but first with a round of applause for all of our panelists for showing up and dedicating their time. So we'll have each of the panelists speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. Uh, but first, we'll hear from Steve Trush. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, my name is Steve Trush, and uh, also I'm a fellow at the Center for Technology, Society, and Policy. And that's out of the uh, School of Information. That's where the research that Mukhan uh, was talking about uh, is, is being generated, up, and I appreciate their support. So we're going to talk about the Stingray. And as some of you have not heard about the Stingray, I wanted to make sure that none of you are here for marine life. That's probably a different school. Um, but as, as McCullough was talking about, Stingrays have been in the news. As we see the headlines from the Chicago Tribune, Baltimore Sun, um, about their use, as well as uh, alleged misuse. And they're also making news due to the efforts of people like Brian uh, changing policy and, and legislation in the state of California. Um, but, but what is a Stingray? So a Stingray is a name for a cell site simulator. Uh, a Stingray is particularly the Harris brand of cell site simulator. And cell site simulators are a device that simulate a cell tower, and they entice you know, your, your cell phones to connect to it in order to share information. Um, and they're primarily used for tracking and, and locating where those cell devices are. Now, uh, they're not just made by Harris. They're made by over a, a dozen other companies. They're not just limited to the United States um, or government use. In fact, you can build your own. There's been various research projects um, where they built one for 1000 to you know, $1,500, and you could buy one on Alibaba. Um, you know, various models have different capabilities, and there's also modifications. You can get amplifiers, different antenna packages, um, so, so that it works with in different environments and across different networks. Generally how it works, uh, your cell phones are constantly looking for a uh, better signal as you're moving around, and it's trying to find the best tower to communicate to your network. Now, um, a Stingray can be installed into a, a vehicle, and that uh, vehicle, once it's turned on, simulates a cell tower, and if it's in range of a cellular device, it will, you know, basically show itself to be the best option. It'll have a higher signal strength uh, for your network. And uh, there'll be this little bit of a handshake where the, your mobile device will identify itself, uh, usually uh, by an MZ, which is uh, basically an identifier for a SIM card. And then as, as that identification it gets logged in the Stingray, um, either from your movement or the vehicle movement, that the location and the distance uh, from the Stingray can be identified. But this diagram doesn't really do a good job of depicting it because we're never just one person standing in the middle of a field. Um, instead, there's masses of, of people, all with their mobile devices. So when a stingray turns on, everyone within range, and it could be you know, 200 meters is generally the, the, the standard answer when someone says, what's the range of uh, a stingray? Again, that doesn't count for various um, amplifiers or different antenna kits. But everyone, cell phones can be, uh, sh will be sharing information with that device. Um, 
It's even more obvious when you think about Stingray-like devices can be put on airplanes with ranges over miles, and they're gathering information and communicating with mobile devices. <clears throat> There's uh, various different modes that uh, a Stingray can operate in. Uh, you have registration mode, uh, which is, if you think of uh, it logging all those uh, MZs, all the identifiers of the devices that are within its range, it's, it's like a dragnet. And it's useful for if there's an unknown device um, that, you know, for instance, the, the police don't know what the specific MZ or the identifier for the cell phone of their suspect is, they can try to log everyone's uh, identifiers within their range and slowly try to narrow down what the MZ is for their suspect. It's also used for uh, if it's a disaster response and they want to find uh, the locations of any active cell phones. Uh, another mode is catch and release, where uh, whoever's using the Stingray can limit the operations to a range of identifiers and MZs, and even though it will still be interrogating all, all the various cell phones and getting the signals and communicating, it will disregard and not log the um, cell phones that aren't on that list of uh, you know, suspected MZs. Now there's also various relationships with the network. You can have a Stingray that's operating in an identification mode, where essentially it's getting the information from the cell phone, but it's allowing the cell phone to continue to operate on the network. So, you know, once it's done uh, getting the identification, it will return it, and uh, all your messages, all your, your phone calls will continue on the, the network as, as previously. But there's also uh, a camping mode, which is what can be referred to as a man in the middle, um, where the communications from the device are going to be routed through the Stingray. So the Stingray, it, on one end, is talking to your mobile pro provider and your mobile network, and on the other end is talking to your, your cell phone. So any calls, you don't know, but it's being routed through the Stingray and continuing to its, its destination, incoming, outgoing, same with your SMS. And then there's also a, a captive mode, where the Stingray, it's uh, communicating with your device, but you're, it's not routing to an outside, you know, your original external network. All right, there, there's, there's various papers, I'm not gonna get into it, um, discussing how that authentication um, process happens, but essentially understand that the MZ, which identifies the SIM card, uh, is, is transmitted in, in plain text, uh, to the uh, Stingray, it's not encrypted. And even when you're thinking about other networks, uh, okay, 4G LTE, even 3G has better encryption um, of the actual uh, communication contents than a, a 2G network. A Stingray can tell the phone to downgrade the level of encryption it's using, basically saying, okay, um, sorry, the network you're on cannot support uh, using anything greater than 2G. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about MZ and IMEI. Just understand MZ ident identifies the SIM card, IMEI identifies the device. There's various different uh, names depending on whether you're using CDMA. Um, but then, importantly, what can actually be collected? Um, the standard is the MZ and the IMEI, and that's used to, as I said, you know, that, that's the initial identifier for the device and going off of the signal strength from the device um, to, the, to the Stingray, you can figure out through triangulation where that device is located. But there is more that is possible to be collected and um, as, as Munkin said, it usually requires additional software. Um, if you want the communication contents, for instance, well, it will require additional processing to either you know, do real-time de-encryption uh, of the contents, or um, if you want actual uh, data content, uh, you know, SMS that's being exchanged or uh, web pages that are being visited. And I just want to say that you know this doesn't doesn't mean you shouldn't be using in encrypted uh, means such as like Signal to exchange messages. That is an additional layer of encryption that a, a Stingray wouldn't be able to compromise. We're talking about the encryption at the, the mobile network le level. Um, and additional uh, actions that can be taken, we already talked about, it can downgrade uh, the level of encryption, 
deny service. It can, uh, there's been reports of you know, sending spam messages. And again, it, this is not necessarily what I'm saying uh, you know, police in the United States are doing. This is the capability of devices you know, similar to the, the Stingray device. Um, but it's important to think about, okay, if someone can spoof a text message, you know, because they're in that man in that man in the middle mode. They can say, okay, well, I'm looking at your frequent contacts, and you know, through various other means, they can also understand your pattern of life and the way you use your mobile device, whether through you know, uh, you know getting records from the, the phone company, and they can say, okay, well, we're going to send text messages from a specific address, um, and. If there's a link, a link could be a link to malware or, or various other, uh, uh, other data collection uh, platforms. All right, and uh, briefly, why are these being used? Uh, there's uh, reasons, like in the Oakland uh, policy that are set aside, so, such as locating missing persons, kidnapped persons, um, victims of in a mass casualty incident, like an earthquake, or if it's an assisting investigations, you're trying to find a, a murderer, alleged murderer on the loose, or apprehend some fugitives. But um, we can also see it in the news that this is not always why it's used. It's also, um, there's reports of it being heavily used in, in Baltimore, Tallahassee for you know, petty theft, and you can see the headline. It's also used for you know, finding thieves of $50 worth of chicken wings. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up now, but here's generally where they are. But understand that in gray does not mean that's not where they're being used. As you can see, there's 13 federal agencies through public records requests uh, have been identified as having uh, a Stingray-like capability. And obviously, federal agencies can operate in the states in gray. And there's also maybe the states that didn't respond to a public records request that they have the device as well as, uh, you know, or uh, the device may not be found. And that's all I have. So I guess I'm up next. That was a really um, nice overview of the technical capabilities of the Stingray. I'm going to, um, I'm not a technologist, I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to talk about the law. Um, and I want to use this Stingray and the debate over the Stingray as an example of the broader challenges of controlling government use of surveillance technology. Um, for practical purpose in the United States, the Stingray appears to be used in two ways. First, it's used um, to locate someone, right? So to, uh, you go somewhere where you think someone may be, you turn on the Stingray, you force all of the cell phones in the area to register, and you can um, identify um, where someone is. Um, and second, it can be used um, to sort of pinpoint someone in a particular area. So it's primarily used for locational purposes in the US, even though it has these potential other capabilities. Stingrays have evidently been used in the United States for about 20 years, but we've probably been talking about them for about, I don't know, five, seven years. And one question is, um, why that might be. Um, and of course it's because um, the government uh, does have interest in secrecy. It often likes to keep its investigative techniques secret so they can't be circumvented. This poses a dilemma though um, when surveillance technology that implicates constitutional rights is used because on the one hand it's true that in any individual case, right, the use of a specific technique uh, may be something you don't want to reveal. You know, on the flip side, when constitutional rights are involved, uh, the public and their representatives ought to have some say over how that technology is used and ultimately the courts um, and so you need some level of disclosure so that those folks can do their jobs. Um, and this is a common pattern um, with law enforcement technology. Um, it takes a while for public knowledge to catch up with um, new technologies, uh, to learn that it's happening, to begin to regulate them. Um, and um, I think it's a problem that's been particularly acute over the last 20 years um, because technology is evolving so quickly. Um, so. Um, 
In the specific stingray context, though, um, the secrecy was more extreme than usual. It wasn't just that people didn't know that it was being used. Um, it's that uh, the FBI and the federal government went uh, to extraordinary lengths to keep its use secret. So for example, if you were a local law enforcement agency and you wanted to use a stingray, uh, you were required to sign a non-disclosure agreement with the FBI uh, that you would not disclose the use of that technology. Um, and I think a fair reading of that NDA uh, was that you should even avoid disclosing it uh, if you could in the course of criminal prosecutions, um, which raises um, particular co complications. Um, but as the technology proliferated, it ultimately couldn't stay secret. Um, there started being uh, references to these documents in, in, in Public Records Act disclosures, and people sort of started putting it together, and you started seeing it in the course of criminal prosecutions. Um, and um, so that's where most disclosure has occurred. Um, there's a famous case, there's an, you know, an incredibly um, talented pro se litigant, Daniel Ringmaiden, who almost single-handedly did more to elevate the profile of this um, than anyone else. He was representing himself and he just felt like um, something had happened, that he had been located in a way that seemed improbable and, and he kept filing motions and motions and finally the government disclosed the use of this technology. Um, so um, why do we care about the use of the Stingray? Um, well, I think people think it has potential constitutional ramifications. Um, so, uh, and they sort of fall into two categories. So it, you know, it can locate you with great um, accuracy. Um, so if you are um, inside your house, it can potentially tell law enforcement agents where inside the house you were located, right? So some would say that's a sort of a search of the home. Um, and now the government, the, the federal government for the most part, concedes that uh, it should obtain a warrant before using a stingray, um, but for a long time that, that was not necessarily the case, and a lot of cases, uh, suppression cases, were litigated surrounding the issue of whether the stingray um, requires a warrant, um, and civil liberties advocates uh, said it did because it can reveal sort of facts inside the home. There's also an argument which no courts have accepted, but some people um, persist in making, um, that the use of a stingray is is sort of a, is analogous to a general search that should never be allowed, and it's because of its dragnet nature, right? You can't simply locate one phone. You end up gathering up the information on all of the phones, on all of the people, and the question is, um, how does that play into the Fourth Amendment standard? And these questions are largely are largely unresolved. Um, this pattern of both, you know, first needing to uncover the existence of the technology um, long after it's been entrenched and then having to litigate about what constitutional standards are to apply or one you see recurring over and over again um, in new technology cases. Um, and one of the things we've done with the clinic uh, is we launched a partnership with an organization called the National Association for Criminal Defense Lawyers and we developed a series of short primers for defense attorneys to try to help them recognize the use of novel surveillance technologies um, because they're reeling on the front lines. Um, it is, you know, your standard criminal defense attorneys who are going to have uh, cases and all of a sudden, you know, their defendant is going to uh, apparently have been located um, due to what is often labeled a confidential source. Well, that confidential source could be a person, but it could also be a technology like a stingray. Um, and um, we try to help uh, criminal defense attorneys learn, you know, what kinds of patterns are most likely to uh, give rise uh, to suggest that a stingray was used, which is really important in criminal prosecutions because you don't know the technology was used, you can't litigate surveillance, you can't litigate suppression motions and raise your client's constitutional rights. So, so there's a little bit of a game of cat and mouse of trying to educate the defense bar about the use of these uh, about the use of these technologies. Um, and I think that's also a reason why some of this technology just becomes entrenched before, um, before there's really a discussion about it, um, because it's so hard to uncover that it's being used in the first place, um, that then it'll be you know, 10 years before these issues start working their way through the courts, right? Um, and I think one good example of this is that you know, essentially all of us have cell phones with us all the time, but um, what the constitutional standard is when the government wants to obtain real-time cell site location information is still a question that's largely unresolved. Um, so the good news for you all is that there will be plenty of fascinating constitutional issues left for you to go litigate once you graduate from law school, um, and it's a lot of fun, and, um, and um, so I think now we'll hear from someone who's involved on the ground um, in advocacy on these issues. Thanks. So my name is Brian Hofer. Sorry. Thanks, Professor.
professor. So my name is Brian Hofer. I'm a member of Oakland Privacy, uh, which is a volunteer citizens group that works on surveillance reform all around the Bay Area. And I also have the privilege of chairing the first municipal citizens commission in the U.S. that has oversight of surveillance equipment, uh, which came about as our fight um, uh, over the Domain Awareness Center um, that you heard about earlier. Uh, I, I kind of want to piggyback a little bit on, on what um, Steve and Catherine said, that as of 2015, maybe even the early part of 2016, non-disclosure agreements prohibited uh, law enforcement from revealing this technology. Warrants uh, were not always um, applied for, rarely, if ever. I've actually never seen a warrant that actually informed the court that the technology was being used, so their authorization um, you know, to me was basically invalid. Uh, legislative bodies had no idea that this equipment was being used by their law enforcement. They never approved funding or, or uh, the use. Um, Oakland has had a stingray since 2006. I found out in March 2014 when a Sacramento TV station broke it. No one on the city council had any idea that it existed. So that was a picture until just very recently that we have this rather intrusive piece of equipment running around with no policy guidelines whatsoever. Um, in the last year and a half, State Senator Hill introduced uh, SB 741, which required a privacy policy be put in place anywhere in California if you had one of these. And we used that successfully to postpone in 2016 before the law even went into effect a couple votes in Alameda County. They were getting the big souped up hailstorm, which was gonna monitor our 4G phones. We convinced the board to be an early adopter and write a privacy policy, which at that time was the gold standard. Uh, it included uh, a warrant for every single use. It narrowed the use to very few specific uh, categories. It eliminated the dragnet capability. It had an express prohibition on content interception. The warrant application had to inform the court of the technology and the possible interruption to service. Uh, and we had an annual report. Nowhere in the US does anyone have efficacy reporting for surveillance equipment? I, I just don't understand it. We've had guest speakers like Professor Crump and others come before our commission on, on other equipment. Is anybody measuring the uh, efficacy of this equipment? And no one is doing it. So that by itself um, was a landmark achievement. Roll forward a year, and the, and the Privacy Commission in Oakland finally gets um, established and, and the members appointed, and we got our hands on our policy. We shared the hailstorm with Alameda County, and being Oakland, you know, we took it as far as we could. Um, we added a whole lot more uh, uh, reporting metrics to dial it down to not only who the user is, why did they request it, who authorized the use, but also to show, to guard against over-policing of certain communities, where are you using it? We want to know addresses, or at least the police beat, you know, the street, um, you know, keeping in mind the privacy right of the accused, of course, but uh, finding out as much information as possible so that we are going to have a report on every single use by Oakland Police Department to guard against um, what is possibly you know, the most invasive piece of equipment that we know about at the municipal level. Uh, you know, the, the, the smart kids tell me we need three data points to identify someone, that we can, I, we can figure you out, your patterns. It, it, it's sort of this, the, the mosaic theory, that maybe one data point isn't quite intrusive, but the more that we gather, we can figure out your patterns. And stingrays could easily attend um, you know, 1A events or, or you know, any, any sort of crowd um, uh, environment and just capture MC codes, and they could save those, and they could cross-reference them later, and, and um, then you have all the regular 1A concerns that we always talk about. So to have pushed it this far to where we couldn't even talk about the equipment, there's a hilarious video. Um, Santa Clara County was the first entity that I'm aware of in the U.S. to return uh, a stingray um, because Harris would not cooperate with their um, transparency requirements. The sheriff in Santa Clara County would not even mention the name aloud uh, when being questioned by the board. She's asking him for $300,000 and she won't even tell him the name of the piece of equipment or the model number. So we've went from that like absurd secrecy to now having a report on every single use. 
Last night, the Fremont uh, City Council, who was the third member of this hailstorm uh, application with Alameda County in Oakland, they approved their privacy policy and they used ours. So in the Bay Area, we have established a really high threshold for what is politically possible. All three policies, Alameda County, Oakland, and now Fremont, have achieved a unanimous vote. So we're hopeful, like most things, where the Bay Area and California um, create this upward pressure, you know, this grassroots pressure that we can move this um, elsewhere and, and really push it nationally. You know, the, the feds are like, okay, we'll, we'll prohibit content interception. But, you know, they, they just never go very far. The state, SB 741, you know, we used it, but it's, it's not great either. So hopefully the, the local reform efforts, which we're, you know, expanding throughout the Greater Bay and, and California will lead to, um, basically adopting this model for all equipment. We do have a global surveillance equipment ordinance that we're working on, including here in Berkeley, that really sort of dictates this whole public discussion and reporting um, oversight mechanism that would apply to all surveillance equipment. And it just hasn't been done anywhere. Um, you know, we, we hear a lot of rumors about stingrays. I, I think if you look at this with sort of neutral eyes, the efficacy reporting might dispel some rumors and paranoia, which would be a good thing. Uh, it could lead to more cooperation with law enforcement when, I think law enforcement, at least in Oakland, like our, our relationship is so fractured that they're just like, well, we're just gonna use technology to solve all our problems, uh, which tends to lead to more suspicion from the community. It's like, okay, now we're really being over-policed and over-surveilled, but no one's talking to each other. So I, I think this public conversation um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's normalizing surveillance. I certainly hope not. I mean, I've, I've had to threaten to sue the city of Oakland over this stuff before, but uh, it, it, it takes away some of the misinformation because there's been such a level of secrecy around this. Uh, on the other hand, we, we might find out it's the worst thing in the world, and, but at least we'll have that information and we, then we could uh, uh, make a policy amendment and um, address those concerns, hopefully. Uh, but, um, you know, oaklandprivacy.org, if you want to find out more uh, model legislation that we're working on, uh, we actually have our monthly meeting tonight. Um, and, you know, if you want to get involved locally, um, we could certainly use your help pushing policies. So we have plenty of time for questions. Who can use this microphone? I think I'm just maybe too tall. So we have a couple microphones. Uh, if anyone has a question, do raise your hand and I'll pass these around. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. I um, want to ask, as a threshold issue, to use the stingrays, do there have to be subpoenas over to the telecom providers to correlate at least the MC with a cell phone number? Otherwise, it seems like, given the number of packets or access packets that are being sent to the stingray, initially you're not going to be able to distinguish who among the population you're looking for. Um, so first, you don't need to have the, the, the cell phone number. Um, and using the MC, that's good enough to identify. Um, you, know, you know what's a specific, coming from a specific device. Um, a Stingray, it's a little more intrusive, but it could identify the phone number without going to the telecom provider because um, you could have that phone send a silent SMS or a silent, uh, phone call to the Stingray, and that would communicate the, um, the actual MS ISDN, which is what we call the phone number. Um, but I would say that even if you didn't have the phone number right then, you can log it, and then whether you have to go through a subpoena process or you know, you've done all your network analysis just off the IMSI alone, it, it, it would be beneficial regardless. So if I could jump in. So pursuant to our policy, you would need a warrant, and it would be for a specific number based on a particular set of facts. Okay, so 
you know, even if you tried to do some broad ranging like general warrant, that would be prohibited under, under our agreement. Um, other jurisdictions don't have that protection. So what they have been using in the alternative is what's called a pen register order, which is a lower standard. And of the ones that I've seen executed, also do not inform the court that you're using uh, this technology and what its capabilities are. The reason I think one of our landmark achievements was uh, eliminating the dragnet use is because uh, again, when not using a warrant, you can force all the phones in range to identify themselves. That's what the registration mode is, is that it, it forces all the phones within its range to reveal their codes. So you wouldn't need to go to the telephone company to get that information. I guess you probably didn't expect all three of us to jump in on a relatively simple question, but I just want to separate out two things, right? So there's the standard you need to actually use the Stingray, but then there's also the standard you need if you have like one piece of information about a customer to get other information about that customer from a phone company, perhaps the information you need to use the Stingray. And that's, there's a statute called the Stored Communications Act, and you can get that under sort of a relative, relevant standard. And so as long as a law enforcement agent certifies that that customer information is relevant to an ongoing investigation, you can get that, and then you can move on from there to to get a warrant for the Stingray or whatever the applicable standard is. Does that answer your question? Sort of, uh, oh, uh, going off of that, um, so kind of about the, the dragnet capabilities, but um, more in terms of, is there any information about how that, if there are municipalities that are using the dragnet capability, do we know how they're storing that information that and how, and if, if there's any sort of policy of like when they need to delete it or get rid of it, if they don't have, um, like once they've identified a specific person and then they have all this other information from other folks, is there any sense of what they do with that information? So with the, the recently revised um, US DOG, uh, DOJ guidelines, um, what folks should be doing is purging the machine of any uh, information obtained at the end of the day or when that phone has been located. There are some exceptions for um, natural disaster scenarios. Um, you know, what, what law enforcement is telling us is that this is purely a location tool um, to, to find you know, the, the suspect that is presumably with their cell phone or, or the person, the missing person that they're looking for. So once they've obtained that location, there's really no utility to keeping the MC code, therefore they purge it. Um, but again, guidelines you know, don't have the effect of law. So, you know, I don't know what, 12 states now? There's about 12 states that are pushing the warrant re or have adopted uh, statutes that require a warrant for use and deletion of data uh, once the phone has been located. Thank you for your presentation, Brian. I have a question. Is there a different requirement to get standing uh, for, for the use of Stingrays? Uh, is the standard uh, different from the Fourth Amendment requirement for standing? Yes. Standing, say, my phone, t uh, my telephone conversation was intercepted. Now, what do I need to establish in order to actually get standing and, you know, really ha make a complaint that, you know, I think that's a tricky question. So, I mean, the first question is how you ever know that your information was caught up by a stingray, right? So the answer is you probably don't unless you are prosecuted, in which case, you know, then you can file a suppression motion. But, um, but otherwise, right, that's just one of the issues is how do we deal with the fact that this and other surveillance technologies now tend to sweep in massive amounts of data about people who will never learn about it because um, unless the government takes some kind of action, um, you don't hear about it. So the, the formal legal requirements are the same, but the, practically speaking, your ability to prove that you have been um, even subjected to this government program is, is so low that it's just a non-issue. For our next question, I just wanted to make a brief announcement. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, the event is being put on by the Berkeley Information Privacy Law Association. If you're interested in learning more, just in case you have to head out early, uh, hi in the front uh, with her laptop can take down your information. Can you just raise your hand so people can, yeah. So if you're interested uh, in learning more events, getting involved with Bipla, uh, we'd love to welcome any new newcomers. Um, is, the, uh, is the warrant requirement that you have 
uh, enacted in Oakland enforced by exclusion, or what's the enforcement behind that? Exclusion of evidence, that is. Can, can you repeat that? Because I think part of it cut out. <clears throat> is the is the warrant requirement that uh, from this from the guidelines or the policy that you have passed in Oakland and Alameda County in general is that enforced through exclusion of evidence through suppression of evidence or uh, what's the mechanism it, there? Yes, it, it 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 would have that effect. Um, there's a pending case right now uh, which has been going on for it is the longest motion to suppress. It's it's over a year long. Um, um, Eric Carsaboom was an undercover OPD officer. And Oakland used a stingray uh, uh, without a warrant for what they called exigent circumstances, um, although the period of action was like over 11 hours long. And then I think when the FBI showed up, at that point they obtained a warrant. And I might be wrong on that part, but they, they've had an ongoing motion to suppress um, uh, three guys that ended up shooting that officer. And that's basically the only way they've been linked is a cell phone that was found via a stingray. And um, once that information is excluded, you know, they might be walking. Other questions? Hi. Thanks for your presentations. Um, my question goes to sort of like the, the uses of a stingray that privacy advocates might have less of a problem with. Like I was uh, actually in Point Reyes um, last year talking to a park ranger um, and he was telling me about how you know people get lost hiking and they don't have cell service it's hard to find them and I thought oh have you heard of a stingray you could maybe fly one over it um, and he hadn't heard of it which I th was a little surprising just because uh, I don't know federal law enforcement but um, anyway, is there a benefit to maybe like kind of embracing uh, use cases that don't have as many privacy concerns um, in terms of getting privacy protections in other contexts? Well, I'll jump in there, yeah. I think your question hits on an important point, right? It's not that um, anyone is against the use of a particular technology, or at least I'm not. Um, it's that often the question is, you know, what legal standards should apply, right? How invasive is this, and then how do we ensure that legitimate uses can go forward? And you know, there's many others that I would put in that category too. I also agree there ought to be an exigency exception, although I think that exception often needs to be um, narrowly cabined. Right? You wouldn't want them not to get a warrant, not to be able to use a technology because they could. That was when it was crucial because they couldn't get a warrant in time. Um, uh, yes. So um, I think your question highlights that it's that that's you know that is the function of the warrant is to try to ensure that the good uses can go forward. Um, yeah, I think almost everything I work on has, uh, every tool that we're regulating has a dual purpose. It's, there's search and rescue, natural disaster type stuff, and, and then there's also the law enforcement perspective. And so we've tried to carve out in the allowable uses what those less intrusive, you know, what, what most of us feel are very acceptable uses of these tools. Um, the counter argument is how come nobody ever reports those uses? Uh, I would think that if I was a law enforcement official saving people's lives with a stingray, I'd be all over the newspapers and shouting it from the rooftop uh, to get the privacy activists off my back. And it just doesn't happen that way. So that's, I'm curious to see what our efficacy reporting is going to demonstrate. Uh, the most egregious user that I'm aware of is the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, they have admitted in court to using Stingray over 4,300 times, including, as Steve mentioned earlier, for the pursuit of a $50 petty theft suspect they're not talking about the you know the kidnap victims they've found and, and you know missing grandma and so it's, it's interesting to me to see if they're ever going to use these tools in that fashion that's what they tell us you know when they go to seek uh now that they're seeking legislative approval they say it's going to save lives and um i'm curious you know personally yeah if i'm an earthquake rebel with a dying cell phone battery please come find me uh, but i just i haven't seen it I had a follow-up to the question about suppression of evidence. Um, are there any proposals for how to deal with 
the use of this, unwarranted use of this technology when um, it's used in kind of intermediate uh, investigative steps and either, um, you know, there's an issue of parallel construction going on or um, it's kind of just many links it, uh, in the chain away from evidence that's actually being presented in trial, how to determine when this technology actually has been used in an investigation um, and any remedies that could be available other than suppression of evidence. So is your question what to do when this is used as an intermediate step, right? So maybe you first find someone using a stingray and then... Um, but, but, that, but you get the evidence in some other way, right? So you're not dependent on the stingray evidence? Sorry, could you just could you clarify? Exactly, I know, I know um, prosecutors have been reluctant to admit the use of stingrays in court, so I'm wondering if there have been any proposals in terms of how to detect when this, is being, when this has been used, when the evidence that's actually needed to secure a conviction can be either attributed to other... Uh, you know, parallel investigative approaches um, or um, where, you know, the case can be made without the use of this direct evidence, even when this technology has been used without warrant. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, that happens a lot. It may, now that this technology is less secret, it may start to happen less often, although to the extent law enforcement use the technology right, without getting a warrant, they may be motivated even to dismiss right, cases rather than to risk getting a ruling on the constitutional issue which could be adverse to them. Um, so, I mean, I agree that the question you've raised is a, is a good one. Um, and I think now that the federal government is, at least it, we think, generally getting a warrant um, to use it, there will be fewer instances in which they feel compelled to dismiss things because, because they used it. Um, but the parallel construction question is just such a big problem. I mean, yeah, it's completely designed to insulate review, and it's just a hard thing to get around. Yeah, and, and keep in mind how new this is. Um, where you might want to pay attention is the state of Illinois uh, their statute addresses directly uh, suppression of evidence, and so, you know, probably in the future at some point there'll be some case law guidance um, out there, but it, it's just such a new issue um, now that it's out in the open. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a future concern. I mean, I'll just say one more thing, though. I mean, my attempt to grapple with this has been to try to educate defense attorneys, as I mentioned earlier, right? Um, just trying to show up as many practitioners' conferences as possible to just say, hey, guys, if they found your client at the stash house, but you have no idea how they knew he was there, you might want to think about whether this particular or that particular technology is used, right? I mean, because I just think you will just need a critical mass of savvy defense attorneys working on the ground who figure this out, who realize the technology is being used to start litigating this. Other questions? Here, let me get you the microphone. Thank you for the panel. This is really good. Um, you mentioned this is available on Alibaba. Um, we've been talking about government agencies. Uh, is there any evidence um, or restrictions of private organizations um, using this technology? There, uh, there has been news reports about it being used in uh, China, I believe, in various uh, movement on the black market, I think, uh, being sold to the Czech Republic, uh, various non-governmental um, people. But uh, there was also a report, uh, I want to say John McAfee uh, from the antivirus guy. Yeah, take that with a grain of salt. But he was saying, oh, the, they've installed it in China on some of the airplanes and were, you know, taking information from his cell phone. But... Uh, you can take that with a grain of salt. But you, it, it is a great point. Like, we're not just talking, when I'm talking about the capabilities, I'm not, I'm, there's a line between what I'm saying, you know, US law enforcement can do with it. It kind of indicates, you know, weaknesses in the infrastructure. We only have, you know, one cellular infrastructure, and it's, if it's vulnerable to, you know, uh, U.S. law enforcement be able to use it and uh, target our cell phones, then uh, other people can as well. Well, I mean, you have general tort law, um, and and we have you know wiretap 
prohibitions. Um, FCC. But, well, and, and, and California has as well, but... Um, so there's also restrictions like FCC, you can't use cer certain spectrums. It's, um, you, for instance, you would have to be broadcasting on the same frequencies as a, a mobile network if you were going to use it privately, and that would be illegal. It's tough. Test, test, there you go. Oh, sorry, thanks. <laughs> it's a secret question. No. <laughs> if, um, if you turn your phone on airplane mode and you turn off your Google location history, is that, or, 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 the, the real question is what are the anti-technologies that might defeat this? And so in the future, because we just got all the CIA data dump that they're turning your TV on you know, when it, you think it's off. So I was just wondering if there's technology, cat and mouse, that's going on. Well, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to say that putting your phone on airplane mode, if you're talking about, you know, CIA or various people hacking into uh, devices, you wouldn't really know whether your phone is in airplane mode. Um, I mean, general precaution if you're taking your phone into government facilities, you know, you turn it all the way off or take, you know, when phones you used to be able to take the batteries out, you do that instead. Um, but I, I kind of hate to go over the countermeasures of like, okay, well now if I want to go to, you know, uh, Occupy Oakland protest or Black Lives Matter movement, I have to turn my phone off. And what are the implications for like safety and you know, people leaving their phone or avoiding even coming to protests that were assembled? Um, that, that brings up, but... I mean, I mean, there are um, devices that block the signals, like a Faraday bag. Um, but as Steve's saying, it's like you, you, you basically lose the use of your phone. That's the countermeasure, turn it off, uh, which most people in modern society are just not willing to do. Um, there are um, experimental MC catchers. Uh, they're you know, little software apps that people are, are coding and testing out. Um, trying to basically, you know, detect the presence uh, of an MC catcher uh, within range. Um, I haven't really seen, you know, success with those. Yeah, they're usually very particular to a certain, you know, brand, a certain uh, uh, processor on your phone, um, and whether they can work on, uh, I've only seen it for Android, definitely not uh, iPhone. Um, and then you bring up, uh, there's also people are trying to, make it more readily known where certain, where self, actual cell phone towers are. So if one pops up, if you had it mapped, you know, some sort of application like that. So um, I wanted to know if, uh, if the FTC Rule 5 and the relevant applicable FCC laws apply to the manufacturers and sellers of this technology? Yes, they do, but there's, they've gotten an exception. They've gotten a license from the FCC to use this technology as it's been used. Um, just because we're reaching the end of our time, I just want to sort of talk more, make one broader point, which is, I guess, in some sense, is putting in another plug for Brian's work, right? This is a political environment in which we feel like in a lot of forums we can't make progress on surveillance issues, and I think that makes what's happening in Oakland even more exciting. Um, through the Privacy Commission, um, you know, assuming everything goes as planned, now whenever the police department, the police department wants to use a new surveillance technology, they're going to, you know, again, if everything goes as planned, come to the commission and disclose it and come up with a policy, right? I think this changes the default instead of now law, as is it now, law enforcement being able to engage in surveillance until someone figures it out and then tries to regulate it, the regulation will happen up front. Um, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. I also think um, it could give a window, right, that we haven't had previously into how law enforcement use of surveillance technology is evolving. It could just rationalize this whole process and um, make it uh, really possible to have 
upfront input into these types of questions before surveillance technology proliferates. So, um, you know, so there are many advantages to being in California, but if you're interested in privacy issues, also being able to look at how um, these uh, issues play out politically in the Bay Area, where after all, so much of this technology is manufactured is, is, um, is something that will be worth watching while, while you're here. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, you guys know the courts are slow. We have a chance to get in front of this right now and establish the rules. And um, we have a very uh, receptive environment in the Bay Area to push this and folks follow what the Bay and California does. So I, I would encourage you to get involved. I ask uh, one final question that I think you have all uh, hinted at. Um, in October, City Lab did a report where they mapped uh, the data of stingray usage and they found that in I mean the cities where it's been used it's been used in uh, primarily minority non-white neighborhoods I think in Baltimore they found that 90 percent of all stingray usage happened in non-white neighborhoods um, Steve mentioned that like this could potentially chill freedom of expression people going to protests where they expect they might be uh, surveilled so I'm just curious what work or what should we be doing in terms of trying to connect the dots between movements like Black Lives Matter and the uh, you know privacy rights movement. I mean, our our success, Oakland privacy success, was co or is coalition building. Um, we've always tried to get as many people on board with our policies, and then we show up to city hall with you know mass numbers and say, "This is what you guys got to do," um, and it's been working. I I think uh, the data helps. Um, EFF did a heat map of our ALPR data, which shows even after controlling for vehicle crime and, and property theft, over policing of certain communities, that um, uh, Georgetown Law and, and a bunch of others that uh, just filed the, the FCC petition challenging Baltimore's over policing of certain communities via Stingray uh, is another great way. That analysis shows uh, past use so we can address future use via policy and, and law um, to you know mitigate or, or you know um, you know build in safeguards as to future use. So I mean, yeah, in Oakland, you know, we have that benefit. We've just got a lot of interested, smart, motivated people, and we tend to find each other and um, ally on these um, projects. Coming up on time, uh, any last comments from any of the panelists? I just want to say, I think, I think what Brian said is absolutely right. I think, you know, if there is good news is that we understand more than ever before, you know, um, the links between speech and privacy and who is surveilled. Um, and one of the astonishing things about Oakland, right, was it really was, um, uh, there was a broad base of people who opposed this from all uh, facets of that diverse community, and that is why progress happened. So at least we recognize the problem more now than we have previously, and we can do more to address it. So thanks a lot to all the panelists for this great discussion, and thanks everyone for coming. Again, if you're interested in getting involved with BIPLA, stop by High's laptop to sign up. Uh, you can also check us out at facebook.com slash bipla.edu. Thanks for all the plugs. Hi. You did a body camera oh, yeah. on here. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you have to uh, like a yeah. moderator. No, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So that's like another layer. It's so hard because you can't capture the right? So it's clearly the question that it's someone in the case of the mess. Using things like body camera. Right, but maybe we're using things like file a civil suit. But like, otherwise, it's just a little bit. That's a good way to That's actually the point that you see is for once you have all Also, you're not sure if you want to turn off the grab the device. So, but technically, I assume this device can turn on your yeah. from yeah. some, from yeah, like Jim Lee. Yeah, that would be I don't see, no one knows if that's like a capability. Um, probably, yeah, a lot of like some of the other things, like right. requires, because everything's part of the stuff. Like probably some package yeah. or uh, something that you can yeah, of course. I would suspect you have to install some sort of malware. A lot of that stuff.
I know there's, like, there's definitely other ways that people can turn on and off their devices. I don't know if it's um, but in terms of like saying this also is right now, all the matter is in the old cell. You don't have to talk like, about it. Yeah, like, 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 yeah, like, yeah, but I assume this device, device like, also yeah. has like 20 years old, right? Um, and that's so such a high tech. I assume yeah. there's a new, newer version right now with more capabilities. So Stingray, it was trademarked in like 2000. Maybe 2001, um, and then now there's Stingray 2, and then there's a Hailstorm is the latest one. And every time there's like a new version comes out, you know, the police departments they are the vendors go to the police departments like, hey, well, you know, Hailstorm is better for 4G LTE, and I don't need to downgrade, you know, the network for whoever I'm trying to. Uh, Locate. So it, it, it constantly has like you know, technology progresses. The intelligence industry also you know, it make advances as well. It, it's it's great money for them. And you uh, your research uh, you specialize on uh... Uh, on mostly like how to inform uh, policymakers and you know, community on what's happening with the surveillance technologies in their area. So, it, you know, it's, um, I'm relying a lot on, on Brian, for instance, because he's one of those people who are like, he's that cross between what's happening in the community, raising awareness, and then um, working with policymakers on how do we actually change things. So, uh, looking at technologies that exist in, in Oakland and the Bay Area, it could be, you know, Stingrays, uh, license plate readers, um, the shot spotter, like the acoustic detectors that get for gunshots. Right. Just that there's all these technologies that are in place and most people, we, we just go throughout our day and we're not, we're not aware of them um, or the concerns to our privacy, so. so. But if it's so secret, how would the, like, departments, let's say it's all the police department, how do they purchase or how does the do supply exist? In fact, so I don't think it's just like secrecy. Like, for instance, like shot spotters, um, nothing secret about that. ALPR, you know, the license plate rules have been around yet, forever. Um, but it's sort of within the realm and, of things that we do. And, or and longer than it's thinking. They're but very smart. They, <laughs> they, they end up putting like line items on like city council agendas and it, you know, they get buried in meeting minutes whether something was procured. Um, Stingray, yeah. Yeah, that's more of a special case where there's like all these non-disclosure agreements. I think the, the thing is there's so much um, that happens at the city level, you know, applying for grants, getting the money for not just surveillance technologies, but uh, I mean, like camera systems for illegal dumping in Oakland, that's a big problem, right? That goes through, it's not even the police department, that's the city administrator office. But especially where Brian got involved, where there's this domain awareness center. 